Hello and welcome to this discussion on cohort studies. It's the next study design that we are looking at in our review of the different study designs. Cohort studies by definition are studies that are done within cohorts and so um, let's take a look at some of the interesting features about cohort studies. First of all as a quick review um, we start off with a population we take a sample of that population, some sample size n, and then we measure something, hopefully accurately, of that sample. Now the interesting thing with cohort studies is that we have two measurement times. In fact, that is one of the defining um, features of a cohort study and that will be different than some of the other studies such as cross-sectional studies and case control studies that we've seen in the past. Specifically we are going to measure some kind of exposure and then a certain amount of time is going to go by and then we are going to measure some kind of outcome and I'm going to call it disease here, DZ um, just because, so we measure the disease after that certain amount of time has gone by. Um, this can be really any outcome that we're interested in, but disease is an easy one to conceptualize. So somebody is exposed to something and then a certain amount of time goes by and then they develop the disease. And the interesting, the, the important thing to remember here is that a lot of time there is a certain amount of time that needs to go by after the exposure happens before that exposure can have an impact on the disease. So um, let's say we're thinking about cigarette smoking and lung cancer. If a person um, started smoking today and tomorrow they were diagnosed with lung cancer, and they had never smoked before yesterday, it would be very unlikely for that cigarette smoking to cause that particular case of lung cancer. Because lung cancer has, has steps that it goes through. It, it starts um, as imperceptible, you can't even measure the size of it, there are physiologic changes that happen, and only later on, after a certain amount of time has gone by, um, can that actually manifest. So it's important to think about that physiologically when we're thinking about designing some kind of study is allowing for enough time to go by in that particular design between when we measure the exposure and when we measure the outcome or the disease. So this is two separate measurement times and it's really um, recording whatever that measurement is that is this defining feature. So the defining feature of a cohort study is that the measurement of exposure occurs before the disease onset. So that means that we have these two measurement times. So here's your defining feature. Um, we measure exposure, measure and record exposure before disease onset. So this measuring the exposure, we haven't had this before where we measure the exposure before the disease occurred. So look back back through your other study designs and see how that um, works out in terms of looking and seeing how those were measured. Um, that is important because if we can measure exposure before the disease happens, then the huge benefit is that we're not going to be biased in the way that we measure that exposure. We're not going to be um, accidentally noticing the exposure more in people who have disease or notice um, that the exposure happens more or less in those with or without disease. So we won't have the, some of the the biases that we would have if we already knew which people are going to be having that disease. Now there are a couple of different ways of um, thinking about this this whole time frame here. Um, one is that we could be living now here in this particular time frame 
and here's here's my time scale as I go on, go along. Maybe these are months or years or days or however long we we imagine this time that's needed. Perhaps this is now, and then I have to wait for this amount of time to go by before I can measure the disease. And so this is called a prospective study. In other words, I measure the exposure um, in current time, and then I wait for a while to go by, and I, and I measure the disease later on. Another type of study is a retrospective study, and in that kind of study, let me draw that in orange, um, let's say I'm living here um, in terms of time, and I go back in time and I find some records that recorded this exposure. Maybe they are employment records or health records or something. And then I collect the information and put it in my data set about the exposure. Now, if this is the current time right now, then how does that make, how, how is that different from, say, a case control or um, a cross sectional study that we're asking people about the past? The reason that that's different is that the exposure was actually measured back here. It was, it was measured, it was recorded. Somehow in those employment records maybe um, we find out that a person was in a particular job description and we know that people in that job description were exposed to certain things, uh, certain chemicals, certain um, uh, hazards, and so then we can we can gather that information and uh, put it into our data set. Then we come forward to our current time and we say, okay, which ones of those people ended up having this particular disease, either kind of over time or cumulatively? Remember that cumulative incidence of new events that happen later um, can estimate the risk of a person of a particular exposure. So that this one is retrospective because our current time we're, we're going back and looking at something previously and this one is called a prospective cohort. And so those are two very important sorry I just scribbled over the star um, those are two very important different perspectives. Now each one of those has its strengths and limitations. In a retrospective study specifically, I'm limited to what was recorded by the people way back when. I can't ask specific questions. Maybe they didn't record something that's really important to me like um, a person's um, smoking status or certain foods that they ate or the amount of exercise that they got. So if they didn't record that information about um, a certain variable that I am interested in, I don't have that information. So that's an important limitation of a, of a retrospective study. For prospective studies, one of the really important limitations is that I have to wait for all this time to go by. Um, and so they can be very expensive. I can lose track of people, lost to follow up. Um, they can take a lot of time. And so there are some very important limitations. However, um, the the nice thing about measuring the exposure before the disease onset is that we do eliminate some of the biases that we can have due to knowing who ends up having the disease or not. So this defining feature really um, tells us something about both the limitations and the strengths of this particular study design. Um, there are a couple of different kinds, so let's let's talk now about these populations. There are a couple of different types of populations that we can study, and um, one of them is population-based. Um, th the textbook lists some really important ones that you should be familiar with, um, particularly the Framingham um, heart study. Um, I think somewhere in here I'm looking at the list really quickly. The nurse's health study, the physician's health study, 
Um, these tried to capture an entire group of people um, in their sample and then be able to say something about that whole entire group. And so those were typically prospective studies where they would gather the, the group, the, either the physicians or the, all the people who lived in Framingham or all the nurses in, in different studies and then they would follow them forward in time and then over time they would collect information about who had a heart attack, who had a stroke, who had cancer, different kinds of outcomes depending on what that study was looking at. And a lot of times information about disease is collected forward through time and sometimes even um, information about expo exposure is continued to be collected over time. And a, a very important um, study that you should know about graduating from Loma Linda is the Adventist Health Study. Um, there have been two iterations of that, so now we are currently on the Adventist Health Study 2. And um, that is a study that is based on the idea that we have a, an, a unique population that it has a very low incidence of cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking can be a very powerful confounder in a variety of different studies and it's hard to remove that effect always when we're looking at certain outcomes. Um, people who have um, exposure to cigarette smoke are also more likely to have exposure to other things and so sometimes it's hard to disentangle those effects. So since we have this unique population that has a low incidence of um, cigarette smoking then we can look at the the pure effects of certain exposures on on these health diseases or certain outcomes. And so that's also a population-based study. This, the one of the big benefits of a population-based study is the external validity, which is also known as um, generalizability. Validity. Gen. In other words, we can generalize what we find in our particular sample to back to a larger population. So that's one of the one of the valuable things, and we'll be learning more about that when we talk about um, validity and reliability and those kinds of things. Another very important type of um, population that we may study is something called um, exposure based cohort studies. So let me add that here. Exposure based. And in an exposure based study we take a known subgroup or subpopulation um, who has a high exposure. And so this is where um, one of the benefits that's touted for cohort studies is that we can study rare exposures, especially if we can find a group that we're fairly likely to have that particular exposure that we're interested in. So if, if for example, and, and this is probably one of the best examples that I've heard of both a retrospective study and an exposure-based study, there was a study that was done on radium dial painters D-I-A-L, that's an A. So radium dial painters, and so what these radium dial painters would do is they would paint the face of a clock, and what they discovered is that radium glows in the dark, which is really kind of nice if you're looking at, a, at the face of a watch. If you have something that's glowing in the dark, then you can read the time even if um, it's dark out and you can't see the specific face of the watch. So what these painters would do is they would take a paintbrush and they would dip it in the paint that was mixed with radium and then they would um, paint the, the face of the watch. So if here's, if here's my face of the watch, um, they, would, they would be putting little, little marks on the face of the watch um, with their little paintbrush. Now the, the too bad thing that happened is as they were painting, they would, they would take their little paintbrush and they would dip it in the paint, but once they were done painting all of these little sections, a lot of times they needed to get their brush to be pointy again, so they would take the brush and they would 
put it between their lips in order to make the paintbrush bristles straight again. And then they would dip it in the radium um, paint. So here's the paint. And then they would paint some more on the radium dial. Well, as we know now, radium um, can cause a variety of different health effects, most notably cancer. And so what somebody started noticing is that these radium dial painters started having cancer of the mouth and other, other cancers and other health issues. And they said, I wonder if there's something about the radium that is causing this. And so what they did is they went back and they looked for a group um, that was radium dial painters. They compared it to other employees in that same company who were not radium dial painters. And they were able to show um, with looking at current cancer rates that the radium was a very likely um, cause of this high incidence of cancers. So um, that's a great e example of this exposure base because what they did is they found people who were very likely to be exposed to radium. They found uh, historical records um, from people who were employed there and then they searched for those specific people. So it is still a population um, study, a, still a cohort study in that we're, we're trying to gather information about a, a population not just um, based on the outcomes that happened, but we can still look at these rare exposures. So one of the um, key um, positive things about a cohort study that people will say is that you can study rare exposures and that's absolutely true. And so we can we can look at people specifically with rare exposures. Those rare exposures could also be found in prospective studies. So we 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 want to look at people with a specific exposure to something and then we follow them forward in time. So that's also possible. So exposure-based and population-based, um, can both of those can be either retrospective or prospective. So that's a little bit of information on exposure-based and population-based. That's a little information on prospective and retrospective. Um, and then the defining feature. So let's go ahead and take, an, take a look at an example from your textbook, Exhibit 7-2. And so here's a, an example where we're looking at um, the the concept of relative risk. And so what we'll do here is we'll fill in the numbers. And this example has to do with a study that was done on people with a history of sexual abuse and also suicide attempts. And so what they did is they asked people um, if they had a history of suicide abuse, or sorry, <laughs> a history of sexual abuse. And they told them either yes or no. And so here we have our total numbers. We had 23 in the history of sexual abuse and 198 in the no history of sexual abuse categories. And then what they did is they um, followed them over a period of time and they found out which ones were um, actually ended up having a suicide attempt. And here we have the, the final numbers. We had 14 of this group that had a suicide attempt and we had 49 of this group. You could fill in these numbers very easily. We never ever use them so um, that's kind of a mute point in some ways. And so what we end up with is an, uh, an absolute risk for each of these groups. In other words, 14 out of 23 or um, 0 0.609 or 60.9 percent of those um, with a history of sexual abuse ended up having a suicide attempt and 49 out of 198 which is equal to 0 0.247 um, ended up having a suicide attempt of those that did not have sexual abuse. And what we can do then with that is we can calculate a relative risk which is 0 0.609 divided by 0 0.247. In other words, we're we're seeing how one relates to the other. How is this how is it relative to the other one? And this number is 2 0.46. So I've just gone through that example in number form, but what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show you what this looks like in a graph because I think sometimes this can help.
Um, so here we have our incidence of suicide. Remember, incidence is new cases. Um, incidence of suicide attempt, and I'm going to just say per 100. So here we have 10 per 100, 20 per 100, 30 per 100. We want these to be um, relative to the same scale, in other words. And so this this first group here with the um, did they have a suicide sorry did they have a history of sexual abuse I'm abbreviating a little bit um, if they did not have a history of sexual abuse this is our referent category so I'm putting it on the left of the graph and I can see that that is um, 0.247 or 24.7 percent and so I'm gonna say that's right in about here so I'm gonna make myself a nice bar graph so no history of sexual abuse um, the incidence of suicide attempt is somewhere around 25 percent and so if we had no history of sexual abuse then our whole entire population would very likely be at this level that's supposed to actually be at the same level as this so okay um, however if we know something about their history of sexual abuse and we know that they have been abused then maybe their incidence of suicide is different than that baseline level and we actually discovered that it is different in other words it is 0 0.609 or 60.9 uh, percent uh, per hundred of those who were who did have a history of sexual abuse had a suicide attempt so let's go ahead and put that here so 60.9 is close to 61 so I'm gonna draw a line here and you can see that there's all this extra up above um, so because of the sexual abuse or at least we're saying that it's somehow is associated this relative risk um, that we are having a higher incidence of suicide attempts by this particular margin what we end up doing with this relative risk is we call this level right here this referent group we call this let's put a new scale over here on the right hand side we call this one now if that is one then this would be two and so this ends up being 2.46 in other words this the height of this column is a roughly two and a half times as tall as the height of this column. Hopefully that will help you kind of understand um, this whole concept of relative risk um, and also apply it to a specific example. So that concludes our, our review of cohort studies. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video.